Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome to uh, this edition of the Soldiers Memorial Challenge Chat. We're excited today to, uh, to have a presentation about the historic 4th of July by Dr. Uh, Adam Cribley from Southeast Missouri State University. But before we get to that, uh, we'd like to thank our sponsors for today's challenge chat, uh, which is sponsored by Billman Trucking Company. It's through sponsorships like this that allows for us to offer these amazing challenge chats and to bring in uh, phenomenal uh, guest speakers like Dr. Cribley um, and others that will be presenting throughout the month of July and throughout the summer. But without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Adam uh, Cribley, who's an author, uh, who's a professor and a distinguished scholar at Southeast Missouri State University and this uh, program called Historic Fourth of July. Now he, will, now he will be answering questions at the end. We do ask that uh, you go to the bottom of your screen where you'll see the Q and A uh, box, and you can type in questions. And at the end of those, uh, at the end of the program, we'll be taking those questions. All right, and uh, Adam, take it away. Thank you, Myron Alonzo. Um, well, thank you first of all for for having me come and uh, and talk at this uh, challenge chat. I'm I'm very excited to. Uh, to, to speak today about the, the historic 4th of July. Um, as Marvin Alonzo mentioned, I am a uh, historian at Southeast Missouri State University and also the author of a couple of books, one of which uh, is a lot of what I'm drawing on today. And that book is titled Parading Patriotism, Independence Day Celebrations in the Urban Midwest, 1826 to 1876. So kind of a mouthful, but really, what it encompassed was how uh, Midwesterners celebrated the 4th of July in the mid 19th century. And so what I'm gonna do today is talk about kind of the early 4th of July celebrations, those that took place in the late 18th century, uh, obviously mostly on the Eastern seaboard, before moving then to a more um, uh, Midwestern, I guess, view of how the 4th of July looked for much of the 19th century. And then just wrapping up a little bit about the 20th. Uh, so typically, if this were an in-person uh, in person presentation or, or with my students, I would have people raise their hands and, and tell me what they do on the 4th of July. Uh, but rather than do that in this setting, what I'll do is just kind of maybe give an overview of, of kind of a typical 4th of July celebration in, uh, in, in the United States today, although as we all know, 2020s might be a little different than that. So the typical, you know, people celebrating the 4th of July often celebrate with fireworks and picnics, barbecues, time with family. Uh, they might go if they're in, you know, near a, near a beach, go to the ocean or to a lake and go boating. Uh, there are a lot, a lot of outdoor activities. Uh, some people do, of course, participate in civic parades or perhaps even go to cemeteries to honor those uh, who served the country. Um, but the, the 4th of July is celebrated much differently today than it has been over the 200 plus year history of the United States. And uh, to, to look at this, I wanna first kind of dig back to the very first 4th of Julys. The popular narrative is that in 1776, on the 4th of July in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, 55 delegates of the Continental Congress met and signed the Declaration of Independence which had been written by Thomas Jefferson, and that set off the American Revolution. Well, there are a lot of problems, of course, with that narrative. Um, it obviously it doesn't, doesn't go into the nuance maybe of the story, but uh, the problems specific to the 4th of July there are that Thomas Jefferson was not a solo author of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, the Declaration of Independence was in fact submitted to Congress on the 2nd of July, rather than the 4th. And only two men had signed on the 4th of July, or signed on the 4th of July. Uh, in addition, the American Revolution by that point was over a year old, the shots at Lexington and Concord having been fired in the spring of 1775. So why do we celebrate the 4th of July today? Uh, if you look at a timeline of 1776, it makes some sense why the 4th of July, but, but maybe not so much. And go ahead and, and click to the next slide there, um, if you would. So in June of 1776, the Declaration of Independence was drafted by Thomas Jefferson, 
with input from Benjamin Franklin and John Adams. And Jefferson's uh, original vision was about, or original version, was about 25% longer than the document that would be eventually uh, accepted. And one of the big things that Jefferson included was a clause that basically blamed slavery on the English. And, uh, and Adams and Franklin uh, encouraged him to, to edit that out. So on July 1st, 1776, the draft of the Declaration of Independence went to committee. And in this committee session, uh, there was, uh, it, it was far from unanimous how they would address these, these concerns. In fact, in this kind of straw poll that took place on July 1st, Pennsylvania and South Carolina voted no against the Declaration of Independence. New York abstained, and the uh, delegates for Delaware actually split their votes. They were divided. Despite this, on July 2nd, the document was submitted to Congress. On July 2nd, 1776, John Adams famously penned a, wife to his, uh, penned a letter to his wife, Abigail, and he wrote that the holiday would be celebrated with, quote, shows, games, sports, guns, bells, bonfires, and illuminations. Uh, he was speaking of the 2nd of July, when he thought would mark the beginning of this new United States of America. On the 2nd of July, then, in order to make sure that this, um, this, these measures passed, South Carolina reversed their votes from no to yes. The Pennsylvania delegates agreed to allow the colony to vote yes. Um, they still, as a delegation, three of them voted yes and two no, but it, it was enough to pass in Pennsylvania. Delaware had, they brought in a ringer, kind of a late arrival, to swing the vote toward the pro side voting yes, and New York still abstained. And so uh, no one actually signed the document on the 2nd of July, but it was officially submitted. On July 4th then, the Declaration of Independence was formally adopted. It was signed that day by John Hancock and by Secretary of Congress Charles Thompson, becoming the only two individuals to sign the document on the 4th of July. On July 8th of 1776, we see the first celebrations. In Philadelphia, we have the first public reading of the Declaration of Independence. And on August 2nd, 56 persons signed the document. Um, in fact, the last signature on the original Declaration of Independence doesn't come until months later, when in November of 1776, a newly elected uh, representative from New Hampshire said that he wanted to sign it as well. Uh, and of course, at that point, they, they put the map on the back that would be uh, discovered in National Treasure, but, uh, but enough of that. So go ahead and click forward. Um, the first uh, celebrations, really, then, of the 4th of July took place in 1777, almost a year after the signing of the Declaration. 13 guns were fired, once at morning and again in the evening, on July 4th in Bristol, Rhode Island, uh, possibly the first uh, community-wide celebration. In Philadelphia, um, as you can imagine, they celebrated with great gusto. They had an official dinner for the Continental Congress hosted by the city. There were toasts, which I'll talk more about in a moment, 13 gun salutes, speeches, prayers, music, parades, troop reviews, and then at the end of the day, fireworks. The following year, in 1778, George Washington was of course commanding the, uh, the American forces during the American Revolution. And on that day, on the 4th of July, 1778, he marked the holiday by giving his soldiers double rations of rum. Uh, the men wore green boughs in their hats and also uh, had an artillery salute at dawn. In Europe, Ben Franklin and John Adams were in Paris, uh, and the French hosted a dinner for these Americans uh, in, in honor of the Declaration of Independence, marking the first celebration of the holiday in Europe. Now, the, first, the, the typical 18th and early 19th century Fourth of July celebration followed a pretty well-ordered pattern. By the 1780s, this was in place, and this really lasted until uh, roughly the 1820s and in some places even farther into the 19th century. So most, most towns would begin the morning with an artillery or rifle salute at dawn. Young boys and men would, sh uh, would start shooting off fireworks. And sometime mid-morning, often maybe 9 or 10 o'clock, 
there would be a, an assembly, the crowd, crowds would assemble and there would be a parade. Usually that parade would wind through the town and end at some sort of public meeting house, perhaps a courthouse, maybe a church. Uh, and at that point there would be more fireworks. And during this parade and in the planning um, before it, men would begin drinking. Um, oftentimes at this point they were drinking beer, but perhaps uh, depending on where they were, hard cider was often used as well. At the courthouse or meeting house, there would be a long speech. Um, now, sometimes these speeches were relatively short, 15 to 20 minutes. More often they were long, sometimes an hour or even two hours of speechifying. A lawyer or preacher would often be, uh, be given the task of, of speaking. And the, the, many of these speeches were published in newspapers. And so we know a lot about what they said. Most of them, as you can imagine, look backward to the founding fathers, the obligations of being an American, discussions about the greatness of democracy and the greatness of America. And then after this, these speeches would end, really the formal part of the day had concluded. Following these speeches, the, uh, the, the towns kind of split into different parts. The young boys of the town would go and occasionally shoot firecrackers or run around and play games. Uh, the girls would go with their mothers to the kitchens and make huge um, Fourth of July picnics, Fourth of July feasts, and the men would go to the taverns to drink. Now, the taverns, the drinking was very orderly at that time, especially in terms of the Fourth of July. And, and by orderly, I mean there was a, a routine to it. Prior to these, this toasting, the men of the town would come up with a list of 13 toasts. These were written down and well-established. And although they varied by location and time period, uh, they did follow some rough guidelines. So what would happen is the Toastmaster, uh, an important person in town, maybe the mayor, maybe a lawyer, would offer the first toast. And the first toast was almost always to George Washington. And so the Toastmaster would say to George Washington and everybody would raise their glass and take a drink. Uh, they would come up with 13 toasts, reflective of the 13 original colonies, of course. Depending on the gathering, the second toast might be to John Adams, or if it was a group of Democratic Republicans, to Thomas Jefferson. They might toast the flag or the American Navy or Army. Uh, they, might give in, they might toast to a particular uh, cause at the time. So many would drink to the French Revolution when it was taking place a decade after the American Revolution. So following these 13 toasts, there would be what were called voluntary toasts. Now this is where these got kind of fun because of course after 13 drinks, and now granted these might be fairly small drinks of low alcohol content beer, but it wasn't always the case. So by 13 drinks, people might be getting a little jolly, a little rowdy, and they might be drinking uh, to canals because they liked canal building or to roads, or um, they might uh, drink to public education Regardless, the last toast was often to the fair sex, and they would, they would drink to women to, to conclude their drinking revelry. Um, not surprisingly, African Americans felt out of place and left out of these Fourth of July celebrations. It was still symbolic, though, the Fourth of July. In 1799, New York required that all slaves would be freed no later than the Fourth of July, 1827. Many African Americans celebrated the day after the Fourth of July, July 5th. They could still be patriotic, but they didn't have to worry about uh, celebrating freedom they didn't have. There was a very famous speech given by Frederick Douglass some decades later called What to the Slave is the Fourth of July. It was really poignant in looking at how the Fourth of July meant something to white people that it didn't mean to African Americans. In 1826, the United States celebrated its 50, 50th year with what was called the Jubilee Celebration. Ironically on that day, both Thomas Jefferson and John Adams died uh, the 4th of July, 1826, which is a pretty crazy coincidence that its importance was lost on nobody at the time and, and was, was often referred to in, in contemporary articles. Ironically, James Monroe also died on the 4th of July, five years after Adams and Jefferson. So three of the first five presidents of the United States died on the 4th of July, which is a, it's a pretty crazy stat. Calvin Coolidge, uh, some decades later, was born on the 4th of July. And so those presidential connections on the 4th are, are pretty interesting. 
Um, clicking ahead, the, the, the 4th of July looked pretty similar throughout much of the early 19th century. However, it transformed dramatically during the American Civil War. When the Civil War broke out in 1860, uh, celebrations of the 4th of July divided. In the states com uh, comprising the Confederacy, some of the early celebrations, like in 1860, were celebrated with great gusto. After all, they believed that they were carrying on the mantle of the founding fathers. In the Union, uh, initially, there was some of that same excitement and enthusiasm. However, um, there were also muted celebrations. Sometimes the, uh, the 4th of July would be used to, to raise money for sanitary commission, um, helping the troops with supplies. Sometimes women would spend the day, rather than cooking huge meals for their drunken husbands, uh, they would spend time knitting socks for troops. Boys would play at war in the city street, shooting fireworks off at one another and uh, playing war, essentially. On the 4th of July, 1863, we have another important inflection point in celebrations of the 4th of July. On the 4th of July, 1863, News reached Eastern states of two incredibly important victories for the Union in the American Civil War. The first of those was at Vicksburg, a river city on the Mississippi River. Uh, on the 4th of July, General Ulysses S. Grant finally won this siege that had lasted uh, quite a while. They'd been trying to, trying to uh, capture Vicks Vicksburg for some months. The capture of Vicksburg kept the Union Army in control of the Mississippi River and effectively cut the Confederacy in half, isolating Texas and other parts of the Southwest from the Southeastern part of the Confederate States of America, as well as limiting trade on the river. In uh, the North, the turning point battle took place in Southwestern Pennsylvania. In Gettysburg, the farthest the, the Confederacy would ever push North during the Civil War, there was a famous battle that took place between the Union and Confederacy. July 1st through 3rd, these battles raged and uh, the Union Army ended up victorious, prevailing under General George Meade. The combination of Vicksburg and Gettysburg, and so again, they both happened close enough to the 4th of July that much like the deaths of Adams and Jefferson, this seemed to be fortuitous. And people read a, a lot into this, that this was not just happenstance, but was in fact um, divinely ordained that the Union would win these battles and turn the tide of the American Civil War. Uh, and, and that these took place on the 4th of July, again, was a, a huge, uh, huge deal. During the Civil War, we also see a, a transition in how the 4th of July was celebrated. So I mentioned that before the war, it was very common to have civic parades. Towns would sponsor parades that would have not only um, the floats or, or things that we might imagine today in a parade, but also were very militaristic in nature, whether it was a local militia or a group of returned veterans, having a, a military presence in these 4th of July parades was an important part of the day's events. Well, during the Civil War, sometimes there would be military, a military presence. Occasionally you might see a, a battalion or regiment that was returned from the front. Uh, a few of them march in parade, but by and large, uh, Americans were tired of war by 1863, 1864, and 1865. They didn't want to be reminded of the war. They wanted a, a day of respite, a day, a, a break from these, these daily struggles. And so 4th of July celebrations became increasingly um, about recreation and leisure, about escape. And that's going to be a theme we'll, we'll really see into, until, the common, uh, until the modern day. So if you go ahead and click forward. So 1826 was the Jubilee celebration. 50 years later, America celebrated its centennial, its 100th birthday. The biggest event on the centennial was, uh, took place in Philadelphia, where the United States held um, the Centennial Exposition in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. On opening day, nearly 200,000 spectators poured into the three mile radius of this Centennial Exposition. Visitors marveled at the Corliss steam engine, which powered much of the machinery housed there. They watched as the Alexander Graham Bell telephone prototype uh, allowed for communication over long distances. They saw an early version of the typewriter, an electric dynamo that promised to harness electricity. Um, there were a variety of eating establishments that included the Great American Restaurant, 
uh, a New England log house, a modern kitchen. Uh, it was very much um, not a celebration of America's past, so much as it was a celebration of America's future. And we're going to see that again become a common theme throughout the 19th and 20th century of celebrations of Independence Day. On the 4th of July in Philadelphia, at this centennial exposition, there was a huge celebration in Independence Square. Speakers welcomed the next American century. This is taking place, of course, at a time when the nation is still divided, when there is still reconciliation taking place between North and South. This is a time when we're still in the midst of reconstruction. This is July of 1876. Four months later, we see the lead up to, or we see the, uh, the celebration of um, the election day in 1876, the election that would bring Rutherford B. Hayes to the White House and the great compromise that would ultimately end reconstruction. Interestingly, I teach um, a lot of American history surveys and the course break off, breakdown is usually, um, the, you know, Native American history all the way up to 1877 and then 1877 to the present. And so this centennial exposition is in many ways a dividing point, not only in celebrations of the 4th of July, but in the, uh, the, the narrative of American history. Also at this time, post-war 4th of Julys become more focused on commemoration and commercialization. At first we see um, business people taking advantage of the 4th of July as an opportune time to sell American flags or red, white, and blue bunting or particularly patriotic clothing, uh, perhaps a red, white, and blue check dress. But then we see advertisers start to link sales uh, to objects that aren't necessarily associated with the 4th of July. Things we take as commonplace, and you can see if you're, if you're following along, the PowerPoint includes a 4th of July sale, and this is actually from Kansas City, a 4th of July sale on pillow top mattresses. What does a pillow top mattress have to do with the 4th of July? Well, nothing. But the idea of using a holiday to promote sale items is something, again, we see as very commonplace today. But beginning in the 1870s, there were questions about how reasonable that was to co-opt the 4th of July with commercial interests. Um, clicking ahead, you'll see that not only was commercialism problematic around the 4th of July, but the 4th of July was frankly becoming a pretty dangerous holiday. I read somewhere a few years ago, and I don't know if it's still true or how accurate it was at the time, that the 3rd and 4th of July are the days in which there's the most alcohol consumed in the United States during the year, and also that there's the largest number of uh, drunk driving uh, arrests and accidents and everything. Um, but this notion of the 4th of July being a, a day of commercialism and, and uh, entertainment uh, traces back to, again, the late 19th century. In the early 20th century, there was a movement called the Safe and Sane Fourth. Doctors, police, fire personnel, all kind of banded together, their national organizations, to look at this idea of the 4th of July and particularly the dangers that it seemed to pose. They proposed a new 4th with beauty pageants, alcohol-free picnics, and patriotic speeches instead of what had become commonplace at the time, which is lots of alcohol consumption and lots of fireworks. Mostly though, this is kind of an attack by elites on the lower classes. The uh, many elite Americans believed that the 4th of July was becoming too political. The early 20th century is a time of the rise of socialism, progressivism, uh, rise of labor unions and union activism. And so the 4th was very clearly linked with those kind of uh, grassroots campaigns that frankly elites felt, uh, felt uh, danger because of. And so utilizing the 4th of July uh, for their own political purposes. And of course, harnessing this idea of kids blowing off fingers and people consuming too much alcohol on the 4th of July uh, becomes part of this larger movement to look at the, uh, or to encourage a safe and sane 4th. Clicking ahead, uh, the, so the, the, the way that Americans celebrated the 4th of July by the early 20th century was pretty similar uh, between the 1870s and really 1920s and 30s. The 4th of July had become very commercialized. 
and picnics, um, spending time with family, those sorts of things had taken over uh, uh, kind of the day's calendar. So what I want to do is look at a couple different isolated events, a couple different years within the 20th century in which the 4th of July was particularly important or particularly relevant. So if you click ahead, uh, the, in, in 1908, African-American boxer Jack Johnson won the World Heavyweight Championship. It's, it's hard to imagine maybe in 2020, but boxing was in this period right on par with baseball as the most popular American pastimes. Everybody followed boxing and the, the biggest boxers in the United States were among the largest celebrities in the entire nation. So in 1908, uh, Jack Johnson defeated the overmatched Tommy Burns to win the heavyweight championship. White media lampooned Johnson as possessing ape-like subhuman qualities. They terrified readers with stories of Johnson's well-known love of white women. And so Johnson becomes this target of racial hostility in the early 1900s. Almost immediately, the search began for a white boxer who could defeat Johnson and bring the championship back to white America. And in 1910, they found their great white hope, uh, retired boxer James Jeffries. Jeffries had left the ring as an undefeated heavyweight champion, uh, but had been retired for several years before returning to fight Johnson. So the fight between Jack Johnson and James Jeffries, lots of J's there, took place on the 4th of July in 1910. Now the timing for this was not coincidental. As we saw with, for example, New York banning slavery uh, beginning on July 4th, 1827. And Thomas Jefferson, who I didn't mention, uh, announcing the, the Louisiana Purchase on the 4th of July um, uh, in, in 1801. This is making use of the patriotic inclinations of the holiday by, uh, by promoting this fight as a battle of the races on the 4th of July. Now the white Americans, the, the media who are, who are hyping up this match clearly want Jeffries to win, although the fight itself wasn't nearly so close. Johnson pummeled Jeffries, who was embarrassingly past his prime, in front of 22,000 spectators in Reno, Nevada. As the crowd booed the champion, they wanted to see Jeffries emerge victorious. In the 15th round, Jeffries' cornermen threw in the towel, not wanting their guy to be knocked out by the champ. Elated African Americans throughout the country celebrated Johnson's victory while their white neighbors um, were infuriated and reacted violently. There were race riots throughout the nation because of Johnson's victory over Jeffries in 1910. Again, th that this took place on the 4th of July was particularly important, not only for the African Americans um, cheering on Johnson, but for the white media and the white Americans who wanted Jeffries to, to emerge victorious. Uh, if you click ahead, the 1910s and 20s were a difficult time to be ethnic. While being German was celebrated prior to World War I and II, uh, connections with um, German ethnicity were not as celebrated. There was a movement that, in, that emerged during the First World War in the, in the 1910s, demanding 100% Americanism from ethnic immigrants. In, uh, uh, in 1921, um, Americanization Day, now Loyalty Day, uh, was first implemented. This was to counterbalance Labor Day, which was seen as being um, a, a socialist holiday. So on the 4th of July, 1916, four immigrants met outside a small hot dog stand on Coney Island to resolve an argument about who was the most patriotic. And so they were arguing about who the most patriotic was, and they decided that the way they would determine the most patriotic was the person who could eat the most hot dogs in 12 minutes. They decided that because this was an American institution, that that would be how they determined who was the best American, the most American. So in 12 minutes, a man named James Mullen had downed 13 hot dogs and was declared the winner and the most American, the most patriotic. This of course set off a 4th of July tradition the Nathan's Famous Hot Dog Eating Contest. And this contest took place much of the 20th century. 
And by 2000, the average winner would down about 25 hot dogs in 12 minutes. Then in 2001, a man named Kobayashi, a Japanese man who weighed only 128 pounds, doubled the old record, eating 50 hot dogs in 12 minutes. Uh, this number kept escalating to the point that by 2016, an American named Joey Chestnut, pictured in the upper right-hand corner of the slide, ate 70 hot dogs in 12 minutes to crush the old record. Again, there were mentions of this battle between Kobayashi and Joey Chestnut as representing something larger. Um, Joey Chestnut had to win back the mustard belt. Yeah, they actually gave a belt to the winner of the hot dog eating contest. He had to win it back for America from, uh, from Kobayashi. And so this becomes another 4th of July tradition this hot dog eating contest and its ties to patriotism and America. Uh, clicking ahead, in 1976, the United States celebrated its bicentennial. The Treasury Department printed special currency, a quarter, a half dollar and dollar, commemorating 1776. The Postal Service issued commemorative stamps and um, fire hydrants were painted red, white and blue to honor the bicentennial celebrations. An American freedom train spent 21 months looping through the lower 48 states in uh, preparation. On the 4th of July, Bob Hope celebrated or hosted a bicentennial Star Spangled Spectacular uh, on NBC that was a variety show uh, and, and exceedingly popular. Philadelphia, of course, where the Declaration of Independence had been signed, hosted a number of events. In, in 1976, they hosted the All-Star Game for the NBA, NHL, and Major League Baseball, as well as the NCAA Basketball Final Four. That same year, Ron Kovich wrote Born on the Fourth of July, which of course was later made into a movie with Tom Cruise. This was a seething anti-Vietnam book. Remember, the bicentennial took place just a few years after America had pulled out of Vietnam, and two years after Nixon had resigned amidst the Watergate scandal. This was a tenuous time in American history. Um, and so 1976 was again a huge event in this bicentennial. Uh, clicking ahead, we, we talked about hot dogs being an important part of the 4th of July, but another very closely linked um, event or, or part of the 4th of July was baseball. Um, baseball changes in, in the 4th of July coincided with an increased popularity in baseball. Baseball was, of course, invented in the 1840s. Uh, again, more myth making here. But the first pro team took the field in 1869, just as baseball or just as the 4th of July was becoming increasingly commercialized. In 1876, the National League was formed that same year of the, bicent of the centennial celebrations. And for many squads, the 4th of July became kind of like Black Friday in that they really didn't make any money until the 4th of July. And the 4th of July was kind of a turning point. Team owners would hold double headers on the 4th of July and regularly see record crowds. Sometimes their attendance on the 3rd and 4th of July, if they managed to hold double headers on both dates, would equal or surpass their attendance for the rest of the year. Baseball was closely linked to the 4th of July from a very early age. Uh, in modern baseball, you'll see a, a picture here of 4th of July caps worn for all games played July 4th through 7th of 2019. Every team had its own cap. And in fact, even the Toronto Blue Jays had a red, white, and blue, or red, white, and blue cap. And on their sleeves had a Canadian flag and an American flag. Uh, this, of course, is done in part, of course, for patriotism, but also to increase jersey sales and hat sales. Uh, these alternates are very, very popular and, and big sellers. But the pro game wasn't the only one associated with the 4th of July. In fact, amateur baseball, which was huge in the 19th century, was a big part of the 4th as well. Rival towns often put forth their best nine to play one another for bragging rights. The 4th of July marked a rare day off in industrializing America. And so on the 4th of July, they would celebrate with great gusto, again, with picnics, with drinking, with fireworks, and with long games of baseball. One example, in 1868, a group of all-stars from St. Louis who called themselves the Unions traveled to Cincinnati 
to play their own all-star team. The winner of this game would be afforded a trophy and the title champion of the West, the best team in all the West. Uh, sometimes though, this was even on a smaller scale. And within a village, you might see what we might call intramural games take place. They might uh, play a game as a fundraiser for an orphan's home or for victims of a fire or a natural disaster. Sometimes they played games just for fun. At least uh, several times I found mention of a group of married men in a town playing a group of single men in the town. There was one funny story that, it, that I read in which the married men uh, were behind after five innings and the single men wanted to call the game. They had other things to do. But the married men, the married men wouldn't let them quit and, and demanded to play all nine innings. The married men ended up losing, but by God, they got their money's worth. Um, sometimes different businesses would play each other. Uh, in one, um, one particularly funny contest, a group of Cleveland telegraph operators played a group of Pittsburgh telegraph operators. The Cleveland operators called themselves the dots, the Pittsburgh operators, the dashes. And okay, in my favorite one that took place in the 1870s in Atlanta, a group of players called the Fats played another group called the Leans. And in the newspaper, they dutifully, dutifully recorded the weights of the different players. The Fats totaled 2,400 pounds, the Leans just 933. And the Leans ended up prevailing 18 to 15 in that game. Uh, clicking ahead, you'll see that. Uh, the, the 4th of July today is celebrated again far differently than it has been in its past. And there's an interesting quote here from Irma Bombeck that really speaks to many of the modern celebrations. Uh, skipping ahead that 4th of July is celebrated with family picnics where kids throw frisbees, the potato salad gets iffy, the flies die from happiness. You may think you've overeaten, but it's patriotism. Uh, and so this notion of the 4th of July being a time where barbecues, parades, and fireworks dominate the holiday. Families and friends get together and relax. So rarely do we get together and listen to speeches or really think about what it means to be an American. For many years, this was the primary purpose of the holiday. But really, as I said, beginning with the Civil War and moving into the 1870s, the 4th of July changed and transitioned into a much more leisurely and recreational pursuit than it used to be. So Marvin Alonzo, I think we have some, uh, some time for questions. I see one here about the, the name of the Frederick Douglass speech. Um, so the Frederick Douglass speech was, uh, was titled, What to the Slave is the Fourth of July? So what to the slave is the Fourth of July? And it was published, it was written in the 1850s. I want to say, yeah, I want to say 1851, but it, it's from right around that, that period. And you get a really good sense of kind of how African-Americans engage the holiday and how for many, even free men of color and free women of color, the, the holiday meant something far differently than it did to, to white Americans. Yeah, and um, if you Google uh, what to the slave is the 4th of July, uh, Frederick, you can easily find Frederick Douglass's speech. And, uh, and speaking on, on that, uh, that's also partially why today, Juneteenth is such a big, big holiday in African American communities, uh, because it really symbolizes uh, the fulfillment of the American Revolution or partial fulfillment of the American Revolution, because obviously uh, those revolutionary ideas still live on today in the 21st century. Um, but African Americans tend to celebrate uh, Juneteenth and other freedom celebrations around the Civil War um, uh, and with the meaning of freedom more so than uh, the 4th of July. But that's an excellent question. Um, another question of uh, will the program be available for future viewing? Uh, yes, it will be. Um, on, uh, we have our YouTube channel for the Missouri Historical Society. So if you go to our YouTube channel, um, you can find all of our programs there, including this one will be uploaded, I believe on Monday. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, there's a question that says, when did large scale city sponsored fireworks shows uh, generally start like in New York, Boston, et cetera, um, they, like they are common today? Um, yeah, it's a great question. For the most part, they, they really started kind of in the 1960s and 70s. And so prior to that, um, 
the really the the challenge was the the coordinating right so to shoot off so many fireworks i mean today they're all done electronically by computer uh but it just took incredible manpower and and space to do so uh the bicentennial in fact there were huge fireworks shows in new york city washington dc philadelphia that were televised um and so those kind of cities had them in place by the 18, by the 1970s but if you look at like smaller, like, so I live in Cape Girardeau and Cape Girardeau typically has a fireworks celebration every year. Those kind of smaller, like medium scale cities, those don't really emerge until the 18, sorry, to the 1980s and 1990s uh, because the cost of a fireworks show is just astronomical. Um, so in most places they've existed for, you know, maybe 50 years at the most, but we really don't see those until the 1960s and 70s, kind of the large scale annual fireworks shows uh, that have become commonplace. Prior to that, a, a city might have a large fireworks show, but it was not usually an annual event. Sorry, I muted myself. Uh, the there was an, um, another question um, that uh, that I had that I heard somewhere that uh, like Mississippi didn't celebrate the state of Mississippi didn't celebrate the 4th of July for like decades after the American Civil War because they felt that that was celebrating the fall of Mrs. of uh, Vicksburg. Is that, have you read that or is that true? Yeah, so in, 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 I mentioned that many Confederate states actually celebrated like Independence Day 1860, 1861 with, with, as a big deal because they again saw themselves as the heirs of the revolution. But you're right, after the American Civil War, we really don't see 4th of Julys in the South become Kind of big again really until the 19 until the 19 1900s until the 20th century uh, and in many places even through the early 1920s and 30s they would celebrate confederate memorial day uh, more than they would american independence day because again they as you mentioned they saw it more as a uh, celebrating the defeat of the confederacy um, than they did as part of this this whole american nation and so the fourth of july was very divisive especially when African-Americans kind of um, embraced it more in the 1870s and 80s, because now it's a celebration. Um, African-Americans are celebrating their freedom on the 4th. And so for white former Confederates, uh, this was a, you know, a slap in the face to what, what they believed in. So their, their focus was more on Confederate Memorial Day than it was on the 4th. So absolutely. Excellent question. Uh, the question, uh, comments are coming in saying, uh, this is our, uh, that you're doing fabulous. Um, one person said, uh, this is our third challenge chat and each has been fabulous. Thank you for the speakers. Um, uh, do you know, ah, uh, a question came in. Do you know what Jefferson said about blaming slavery on the English in the draft? Sure. So what Jefferson basically said in the Declaration of Independence, in addition to listing all the things that that the king and parliament were to blame. One of the things on that list was basically, um, I, I'm paraphrasing, you know, Americans wouldn't have slavery except the English made us do it. And, and so Franklin and Adams were like, yeah, you, you might want to back off. I mean, because even at that time in, in England, Engl England would end up abolishing slavery decades before the United States. We all, we even by that point are starting to see a less reliance uh, among many in the British um, on slavery. And so Adams and Franklin were like, yeah, you probably don't want to blame the English for that one. We kind of, you know, we, we need to take the loss on that one. And, uh, and so that got edited out. But basically it was part of that list of grievances that, you know, we wouldn't have slavery except you made us do it. So that was really kind of the gist of that. Awesome. Uh, and as Jefferson was a slaveholder, I find that to be extremely ironic. Right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Another question um, from, I believe, a former student of yours, uh, Whitney. Um, <laughs> she says, uh, you mentioned earlier the fourth celebration, uh, earlier fourth celebrations, women would fulfill a typical role of food preparation, et cetera. When, uh, when do we see that role start to change? Does that uh, transition happen at different times and across ethnicities? It's a great question. Um, I must have done a good job teaching her in class. Uh, so that that role of food preparation, um, 
in many cases lasted and lasts through today. So I know, for example, you know, in the Cribbly household growing up, my mom and sisters and everybody on the 4th of July, they would, they would make all the food, you know, it was a, it was a big part of their kind of like Thanksgiving, like they would just prepare all the food. And that was a big part of what the celebration was for them was making just a ton of food and just kind of eating throughout the day. Um, that role does start to change though, really unsurprisingly, kind of in the 1950s and 60s, in which we see that transition from the stereotypical kind of uh, um, uh, middle class, uh, I'm thinking, you know, the leave it to beaver kind of era mom. Um, as that ideal starts to kind of fade away, we do start to see women more actively engaging in the other parts of the 4th of July. Uh, and and there's a huge class component here as well. So most of the celebrations that I've talked about have largely revolved around kind of the middle class and, and the elites, those that actually have the, the opportunity and ability to take off the 4th of July and just do what they want and, and recreate and, and relax. Um, there are, of course, people who, for them, the 4th of July is a working holiday for many retail establishments, for many people in, in food service, um, they're still working on the 4th of July. And, and so we start to see that split then, that women not only are kind of uh, embracing the other parts of the 4th of July, but also you have a class element. Uh, so um, you mentioned ethnic differences. I, didn't, I haven't found a lot of ethnic differences in terms of how women engage the holiday, but there's definitely a, a class-based uh, difference as well here in how women celebrated the 4th of July. Well, awesome. Uh... Yeah, I think that goes back to that idea of the, the class base. Um, you said earlier that the um, this idea of kind of, um, of danger and alcohol um, going into it, obviously it was usually the, the, the people in the lower class that that, uh, um, that were having usually probably the, the better parties where they were. Um, sure. uh, and so um, well, I guess I would say not better, but more fun yeah. um, in my opinion, but uh, does that, uh, does that, so that plays a role in, um, in, do, well, I guess my question to that is, uh, kind of followed one on um, Whitney's question, is, um, does that change happen around that prohibition era, like the 1890s, early, to, uh, like early 19, uh, 1900s, where prohibition is getting like a big push uh, when it comes to the 4th of July? Yeah, so that's absolutely part of it. And, and this is where, you know, kind of again to Whitney's question, we do start to see women use the 4th of July in a proactive way. So the 4th of July during the progressive era becomes an era where women are using the 4th to advocate for their own political rights. So for example, suffrage, but also um, they're spearheading the, the anti-alcohol movement. Um, the Women's Christian Temperance Union, the WCTU, took advantage of the 4th of July and used it as a huge uh, symbol of you know, of, of the problems of drinking. And so they would regularly go outside you know, taverns or, or drinking establishments on the 4th and utilize it for, for those means. So the 4th of July has always been a very politicized holiday, uh, but certainly women, women kind of co-opted that, uh, especially as part of that safe and sane movement, the anti-alcohol movement that really, as you said, kind of kicks off in the early 1900s and then of course comes to full fruition with prohibition uh, when it emerges with the, the 18th Amendment. So. Awesome, awesome. Um, I think that's the last of the questions. Let me scroll back through here uh, real quick to make sure we hit everything. Um, so you can get to our, um, our YouTube page by going to youtube.com and in the search engine, um, the little, a search bar will pop up and you type in Missouri Historical Society and that will list all of the, the chow and chats that we have. Um, and I can, uh, I'm, I will write your name down and I will, I can email you that, uh, that link so to um, the person who asked, asked that question to make sure that you get that. Um, and it's easy to be easy to, for you to navigate that. Um, and I believe that is all the questions that, oh, so, no, nope, another question came through. Um, when did African-Americans first celebrate Juneteenth? Uh, was their July, uh, was it their July 4th? And when do you think uh, it will be a national holiday? Great question. Um, so the first celebrations of Juneteenth so were really kind of like the Declaration of Independence the year after. 
So Juneteenth is celebrating Texas's abolishment of slavery. They become the last bastion of slavery, however you want to define that. Um, and so it's the next year, the first celebrations of Juneteenth. And it's something that it's very underground for a long time. And it, it's among African American communities, but most white Americans would have had no idea what Juneteenth was, you know, for, for years. And in fact, um, it's, it's, it's fitting that you mention it because I think I had not heard much about Juneteenth for the last several years, but this year, of course, it was a huge, a huge issue. It, it became obviously a, a very politicized issue around Black Lives Matter and around um, uh, the, the president's response to to some speeches that were going to be planned for Juneteenth and those sorts of things. Um, I mean, obviously, I would I would love to see it be a national holiday now, uh, but as far as when it will be a national holiday, you know, that's hard to that's that's hard to determine, and and whether it will be a holiday that that is commemorated with days off and and I'm I'm a professor, so I'm thinking like school schedules and all those sorts of things. Um, or whether it'll be something that's that's celebrated more personally or more individually, I think is is certainly up for debate. Uh, but yeah, African Americans have been celebrating Juneteenth for for 150 years. So um, so yeah, it's, it's certainly been a thing for a long time. Well, awesome. Um, thank you, thank you again, um, Adam, for this uh, this amazing conversation and. Uh, and kind of historical um, look at the 4th of July. Obviously we're coming up on the 4th of July um, in what, two days, three days. Uh, and so we're, it's really great to always think back to um, before we celebrate a holiday or when it's around a holiday to think back to what its origins are. Um, should this be um, for you and your family uh, a, a day where you just take off and um, and uh, and do something around the house? Should this be a day where you go and clean up a cemetery or uh, make it into a day of service. So um, I think that's that's something that we would like to leave everyone with is, is what is the 4th of July and what are these other uh, national holidays? What do, they, what do they mean for you and your family? And what is our, what is our role as citizens uh, to, uh, in, the, in the way that we, that we celebrate or remember these holidays? Um, I wanna thank everyone for joining us today uh, for this amazing Chow and Chat. Our next Chow and Chat will be on uh, July, sorry, let me get my dates right. Uh, Wednesday, uh, July 15th. And we'll be taking a look at, um, at, the, at the border war um, here in, um, in Missouri uh, when it comes to the idea of slavery. Um, so uh, please chime in um, and tune in for that. Um, and make sure you follow us on our social media, on also online. You can find all of our programs at mohistory.org, as well as you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Um, and we look forward to seeing you all at another awesome challenge chat. Uh, and you'll be getting a pop-up for a survey in your, um, uh, after this uh, program closes, please take the time to uh, fill that brief survey. Um, and also, uh, if you would like to become a member, of the Soldier, of Soldier Memorial at the Giving Circle, please follow the link at mohistory.org backslash support. It's through memberships like this that really help uh, keep Soldier Memorial going. So thank you and all uh, have, a safe, uh, have a safe time out there for the 4th of July and please stay healthy and safe. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Thank you.